wouldn't think that one of the first things you want to do is talk about underperformance. <laughs> We would love to be able to go to our clients during a period of drawdown and say, this would be a really good time for you to add more money to the strategy. My name is Neely Gilbert. I'm a co-founder and portfolio manager at Materin Capital. The markets are pretty inefficient in the intermediate term. And we believe that one of the main things that drives those inefficiencies is human emotion. Behavioral biases, things like fear, greed, ego, sometimes just forgetfulness to stick to your knitting. When these things come into play, market prices sometimes move pretty far away from what their true long-term fair value should be. At Materin, our edge really is being able to combine what we think is the best that fundamental investing has to offer with the best that quantitative investing has to offer, which is being unemotional, being systematic, being repeatable. Many fundamental investors have great insights, but just may have trouble exercising on those insights when the going gets tough. You know, I'd say one of the main obstacles in our industry is herd behavior. Many times uh, you'll pick up the Wall Street Journal in the morning and read about what is the hot new thing. And then you'll go around and your clients and prospects will be asking you, what are you doing about this? Often great investment means knowing when not to jump on the most popular trend. Last year, momentum investing uh, actually did quite poorly. Investors will lose their courage in focusing on momentum and de-emphasize it. It becomes um, underpriced in the market. And as that happens, we actually have started to tilt more into momentum investing. And lo and behold, this year, we've seen a positive momentum and negative value year so far. My name is Gillian McIntyre. I'm CIO Senior Portfolio Manager of 221B Capital. So my firm manages a long short equity with a low net strategy. When it comes to our approach on the short side, we have a pretty simple philosophy. We are solely focused on finding idiosyncratic shorts or companies that we think are bad actors, bad players. The philosophy is what we call the five M's. So we think about management uh, and poor players, bad actors. And second is mendacity, bad accounting, SEC correspondence, lawsuits. Third is model, where we think about a very bad business model that's just not sustainable over the longer term. Fourth is something called mania, which is really valuation. And the final is mediocrity. Everybody's invested in the same thing. If one of our companies has all of the five M's, then we're all in. Um, <laughs> it is something that's unique. Um, we've actually patented it. One example, uh, you know, is a company that was a, a solar company, which was very heavily owned by the hedge fund industry. And when we went vocal on it, uh, you know, we got a lot of pushback, as you can imagine. So this was a company that fit all of the five M's absolutely perfectly. But in particular, it was the business model that was very flawed. It was a very levered company, and that was the basic model that they would um, you know, lever up and then get these tremendous returns. And when we came in and specifically did the analysis on the debt, that was the overriding factor that we knew would be its downfall. So the cost of debt was 15%, but the returns were 4%. So you know that that doesn't work over a period of time. We were able to determine that at some point in time, this model would come crashing down. What we didn't realize was that it would take six months before the company filed for bankruptcy. As long as you've done the research, you get this kind of conviction that allows you to really speak out. If we can find those companies, you know, sort of hitting that inflection point that we can basically borrow at a very low rate and we'll sort of sit in over time. My name is Olga Chernova and I'm the CIO of Sankis Capital. We have an approach uh, in the fund that there is a price for everything, even very risky investment, investments. Um, given the right price um, is something that we definitely pursue like CLO tranches, uh, equity tranches of the CLO products um, or equity tranches of synthetics. However, many of these transactions are trading um, five, ten cents on the dollar, so your risk reward is very much skewed to the upside. 
One of the challenges in our business is to continue to be creative. No matter what a great year you had, uh, when the new year comes around, there's always this unnerving feeling as to how do we make money this year. In our market, there was a lot of pressure um, that came from regulators in the recent years. The Volcker rule definitely had made um, it difficult for banks to hold inventory and therefore provide liquidity. Sometimes challenges like that is what eventually forces people to find better, more efficient solutions. Our firm was able to pioneer a new settlement process for CLOs. We have uh, come up with a very interesting way to reset the coupon on the CLOs. It's a new mechanism. You don't have to do full underwriting. Uh, you can kind of embed an auction mechanism in the CLO upfront. So then when you can go to, to refinance uh, the CLO later on, um, you just hold a simple auction. A lot of that innovation actually has been driven by the regulation. I came to the US uh, when I was 16, and at the time, everybody in Russia was uh, either an engineer or a mathematician. Mathematics uh, and quantitative areas were not considered to be uh, difficult. So I think that definitely influenced um, uh, me and my approach, otherwise I probably would have never pursued a career in derivatives. I think there's certain elegance in structured products. The splitting things in the fundamental blocks highlights risks that are embedded um, in the structure. For me, it's about being able to uncover things, doing the deep work. And part of the reason that we're called 221B is um, based on Sherlock Holmes, who lived at 221B Baker Street. We kind of align ourselves with Sherlock. There is a sense of achievement, right? If you've uncovered things that perhaps people in general aren't necessarily aware of, and it protects them. My earliest memory of having an interest in markets was actually when I was only eight or nine years old. Back then, every European country had a different currency, and I started to collect them. So my mother, who was always a very encouraging woman, she, she said to me, well, Neely, why don't you just not collect these pieces of paper, but learn more about what they're worth? So I'd say, look, this currency is so pretty, like the Dutch currency has a sunflower on it. And she was like, why don't you try to figure out what's driving the Dutch, the, the Dutch Gilder versus Deutsche Mark exchange rate? Here's a graph paper notebook. <laughs> the idea that there's something human, a human element, and what drives asset prices is something that I've really held on to.